We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. discuss books that changed the world and changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our third episode in our series on Emily Bronte's classic Wuthering Heights, and good grief, this book is infinitely complex, and last week we went long talking through chapters one through nine, and before I get any farther though, I can't forget to remind you to please text an episode of our podcast to a friend. Uh, and encourage them to listen. We're starting to notice growth in some of these towns. Also, give us a rating, preferably five stars. I mean, we're trying our best to do our best, but we can't grow without you. But back to the story and what a story it is. I mean, today we are going to try to push through till chapter 17. So, to recap, last week we discussed most of the first part of Wuthering Heights. We uh, chronicled the life of Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw as they grow up at Wuthering Heights. Not withering, but Wuthering. We discussed the brutal abuses they endured, but honestly, for the most part, and especially towards the end, we shine the focus on Catherine and what a train wreck <laughs> of a person she is. She's beautiful, she's energetic, she's lively and fun, but she's also pretty much only about herself and I even use the word I reserve for really complicated situations. Maybe she's even a borderline personality. Although I reiterate I would never diagnose a fictional character. <laughs> but it's eerie to me to see how clearly Emily Bronte describes this disturbing condition. And I should say before I go farther, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, but you might know someone that reminds you of Catherine Earnshaw... Um, I encourage you to research borderline personality disorder at your leisure. You think Heathcliff might be another case study? <laughs> Two sides of a coin. Oh, uh, dear. And uh, Emily Bronte predates all of modern psychology, I want to point out. But what she observed and recorded is something that a lot of people have seen. We will never know what or who that something or someone was. I mean, she... She nails the lived experiences of many who find themselves in the situation, as she puts it, honeysuckles embracing the thorn. There were no concessions. No concessions. <laughs> well, and this week, things really are going to get crazier. This what? section is action-packed. It's full of complications in the but plot wait, line. wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> and really, I find myself having to reread this. I mean, I read this book for years, and you can still reread it over and over again. And you're not quite sure, now, what just happened? <laughs> Because Bronte artfully just throws you into this windy world and she reminds you that in this world you can barely catch your breath. You can't understand what just happened. You don't even know what you're looking at. And while the emphasis of the last episode was primarily on Catherine, this week we do need to change direction slightly, although you really can't get away from Catherine. She will not. <laughs> be ignored or not be no, the center of attention. but we do need to devote more attention to Heathcliff and, of course, the other characters in this unusual tale. So, as we clearly saw last week, and we will clearly continue to see here onward, life at Wuthering Heights is absolutely nothing short of violent abuse to anyone who ventures through those doors. And yeah, that's the hard <laughs> part to slug through when you're reading it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and let me point out, as we uh, transition from the first generation to the second, uh, Bronte carefully demonstrates for us that the legacy of abuse often doesn't die with the first generation. And what we're going to see here is generational abuse. Uh, the children are abused by Henley and Joseph, both physically and verbally, 
But Heathcliff is especially abused emotionally and psychologically, and the, uh, the most damaging of all the abuse, and this will all be passed forward. Yes, and Catherine and Heathcliff, they're not the only two characters in the book. Just as Withering Heights is not the story of just one house, and we can't forget that. This is a book about doubles. There are two houses. Of course, there's the one that's chaotic, but there's the other one that's peaceful. And the peaceful is Thrushcross Grange. There are two sets of children, the one that's wild and the other that's tame. But there are also two types of defective love. And Bronte is going to explore both of these because both styles of defective love negatively impact adulthood. And again, as we have said many times on the podcast, authors are amateur psychologists. <laughs> and what they did is they observed people living out these disorders, and then they put them into characters in a book. And uh, so look at these parallel structures. makes it easy to categorize, and appreciate you pointing out the doubles. Um, we have these two children from Wuthering Heights who are clearly victims of neglect and abuse and rejection. They're unloved, and, and that defines their adulthood. And although Mr. Earnshaw loves Catherine and Heathcliff, he subjects them to the merciless, brutal deprivation and degradation of his life with Henley and Joseph. And, of course, this is much more Heathcliff than Catherine. True, and I do want to point out that Joseph is a significant player here, and he's easy to overlook because his dialogue is a nightmare. It's and dialect, and you just find yourself trying to skip over it as fast as possible, which is, of course, part of the experience. But he's treacherous, and to live under this guy's physical and mental abuse cannot be understated. There's one point in the childhood sequence where Catherine gets so upset she throws her Bible into a dog kennel, and I'll add that he's going to be abusive to everyone all the way through to the next generation as well. But safe to say, Catherine and Heathcliff grow up in an environment where they're not loved. However, um, Edgar and Isabella, although they are loved, live in a household of what you could call too much love. They are indulged, and sadly, of course, this is a problem in our modern world as well. When you indulge a child, you do just as much harm uh, as if you neglected that child, but in an opposite way. And Edgar and Isabella are pets. They're weak, too weak to function properly in the world. And where Catherine and Heathcliff have overcome rejection and abandonment, uh, basically by finding strength in each other, or at least the idea of each other, Edgar and Isabella don't have the tools to even deal with anything. They've been indulged. They can't imagine a world where they have to struggle and when they're faced with real trauma, they are not equipped for it. Well, of course, they both wither, and it angers me when I see it in Edgar, and I find myself really pitying mm. Isabella. They both take deals they should have never taken, and they bend when they should have stood up for themselves, and they sacrifice when they shouldn't sacrifice. And we will really see that ultimately... Linton abandons his sister completely all the way to her death. And Isabella, for her part, raises a totally useless human being. And really, none of us can judge their motives for what they wanted out of life. Well, I just want to say this. Edgar and Isabella were the perfect victims for these specific types of disordered people. <laughs> they fit perfectly. Uh, you know, so um, we've all done things that we were likely not, didn't think were the best out of a need for love or, or of a fear of rejection. I mean, that's the human experience. But in this book, Bronte totally contrasts the two totally opposite scenarios. And in each case, their past deficits set them up for a real struggle of a, trying to find a safe love and uh, to trying to find a protection against the loneliness and abandonment and, and stay safe from rejection. And in the case of Catherine and Heathcliff, we're often left to wonder if their childhood injury, childhood injury has turned them into people that are unfeeling, uh, people that use others but don't love others, people that hurt with impunity and simply do not understand the effects of their actions. Or in Heathcliff's case, they, they almost feel pleasure uh, in causing anguish in another human being. Um, it's what we would call a total lack of empathy, again, characteristic of a personality disorder. 
And yet, before this side of the story emerges, there is a moment before all the vengefulness comes out that's sweet. I will say it's a brief moment. (laughs) Very brief. You would miss it if you're not careful. But last week as we ended with Kathleen declaring her love for Heathcliff and then tossing Heathcliff to the moors in exchange for the security and safety of life at Thrushcrest Grange and Linton's money, we're left with a mix of emotions because on the one side, it is possible to have empathy for the choices that are there for Catherine Inshaw. I mean, she is, after all, a powerless woman in the 19th century, and no doubt Heathcliff has no privilege of any kind. Both of them have difficult, almost even impossible problems to overcome, and finding their way without a father figure in this world to protect them is difficult, and in some sense is what charmed many people over the years, and I think it's worth thinking deeply about that immortal monologue by Catherine, and it is sweet when she says this, my love for Linton is like the foliage in the woods. Time will change it. I'm well aware as winter changes the trees. My love for Heathcliff resembles the eternal rock beneath, a source of little visible delight, but necessary. Nellie, I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So don't talk of our separation again. It is impractical. These, darling, are some of the most romantic words ever spoken in the English language. This is not romance. This is a manifestation of people with extremely bad interpersonal boundaries. Well, it's still powerful intimacy. It's powerful interconnectedness. It's magnetic-like passion to feel life, to feel it so vividly, so powerfully. I mean, that is the fantasy, and of course it exceeds sexuality, although there are many who go for that and try to find it there but it's also spirituality I don't know what you say to that but it's this sense that she's expressing of aliveness and I know that's probably not a word but it is a very powerful sentiment and we're going to feel that power and I feel like that's what's so compelling about a lot of this dialogue all the way until the death sequence and maybe even beyond that even though, admittedly, these are very messed up characters. Uh, (laughs) You are finding beauty amongst the ashes, no doubt. The sentiment truly is beautiful. Well, that's absolutely true, and there are multitudes of humans who walk through life and want to find just that one person to share this kind of connectivity (laughs) with. and It's not something that we're guaranteed in life. And uh, I will quote Heath, Heathcliff here from chapter 15 when I put it this way, although that's a little ahead of where we are. Um, I will venture to say that this is how Catherine really feels. She should have endured misery and degradation and death to stay with Heathcliff. But uh, there is just more to it in Catherine's case. This is what we saw being weighed in that balance when she discusses this with Nellie. And why ultimately she makes the decision to betray her eternal self as well as Heathcliff, um, not once but at least twice, in order to protect her present self. Although she uh, really has convinced herself that she's doing all this that she's doing for Heathcliff. Of course. Again, a characteristic of a disorder. Uh, But let me just add this in defense of Catherine. um, (laughs) I'm really not prone to do. And although I don't find much in her worth defending, there is justification uh, really to argue that Catherine did what any woman in that period would do, um, would almost be forced to do with the financial realities of the world as it was for women in the 19th century. But I want to add this too. Catherine may be uh, on the, on the, the weak end of the financial deal, but she's exerting power through chaos <laughs> and debts. Well, that's... Absolutely true. And of course, we don't have time to talk about 19th century women issues and feminist criticism. Mm. And there is a lot to say about this associated with this book. Uh, You can look at Catherine as some kind of original mother or representation of a girl's transition from innocence to experience. But I know you would agree that that's kind of a kinder interpretation. Mm. (laughs) If you just want to see her as caught between socially incompatible cultures. Of course, 
that's one side of it. And there is a sense and the real, and I want to be honest here, there is a real sense that this book is trying to talk about women's vulnerability in regards to property rights. And we'll see that makes her decision to marry Edgar Linton at least practical. Well, yes, it's <laughs> extremely practical. There's no doubt about that. She's very calculating in, <laughs> in what's practical. Uh, but, you know, in Catherine's case, and if you think of her as crazy Catherine. Which you do. <laughs> well, crazy is not a real term in psychology. I know. But I, I cannot look at this book and take off my psychology lenses. <laughs> it's just not She possible. invites it. Yes, and well, we soon soon come to understand that uh, she doesn't see it as a romantic choice versus a practical choice because Catherine Earnshaw is full of passion, but that's only one side of her. Catherine Earnshaw is not told no, not by anyone. She will absolutely not accept that there is a choice to be made when it comes to what she wants. She will have both men. <laughs> and um, it's a little funny how this is expressed in the book, and Nellie speaks to her in uh, in that Victorian way, and but Nellie tries to tell her that marriage is a sexual relationship. You will either honor it and betray this former childhood love, or you will not honor it and betray your marriage vows. And you made the analogy about having your cake and eating it too earlier, uh, and you were right about that. Sometimes you just can't, and uh, that is the literal mortal combat we witness <laughs> in the following chapters because you don't tell. Catherine, no. <laughs> but shifting away from Catherine for a moment, uh, there are other questions about passion itself that Bronte asks as we see what happens to Heathcliff or really what Heathcliff does in, in the name of his passion. Um, is passion a suitable moral justification for overriding moral law? Does personal abuse in one's own childhood lead to involuntary actions and abuse as an adult? Do we let some people off the hook for their behavior because of their past? How or, or is it even possible to, to live a life of freedom and victory if you are clearly a victim of abuse? And can peace be found in revenge? Uh, Heathcliff makes us ask all of those questions. Well, I know that the end for these two is jaded, and it, but it still charms lots of people over the years. So before we get into all the ugly, I'm going to bring it back to, the <laughs> to a sweet moment, and I'm going to incorporate... Emily Bronte wrote some poetry, and there's one poem I think connects to this book. Well, there's a lot of them, but there's one that says this. Though earth and moon were gone, and suns and universes ceased to be, and thou were left alone, every existence would exist in thee. So there you have it. There are some beautiful and deep words in a sense that that's what all men and women want to find in this world. And in her brokenness, even Catherine, as treacherous and unworthy as a person, as there's no doubt that she clearly is, if all else perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe were turned to a mighty stranger. Catherine says that. Okay. <laughs> but Bronte expresses this idealized bond, really, between two people. And although Heathcliff and Catherine never realized the dream... Bronte is expressing the sentiment in a way that is quite real and in some ways is this thing that has captivated lots of people and, and all of humanity really over the years. Heathcliff is the window through which Catherine sees the world. That's why we see a lot of these windows in the story. They keep each other safe from isolation. Without him, she is isolated. Without her, he is. So and you see the references all the time, all this business about being alone in heaven. That's what that means. And, you know, there's sweetness there. <laughs> well, she put a really sweet spin on the whole idea of fear of abandonment, which yeah, is at the core so. of what's going on here. Um, uh, you know, but then the next chapters are going to hit and it turns really destructive after all the sweetness. And these new chapters uh, were an absolute whirlwind for me. I mean, for the first six months of Catherine's marriage, when it's just her and the Linthons, it's all peaceful at Thrush Cross Grange. But Heathcliff comes back with zero explanation, completely transformed, and then Catherine changes. 
Yes, and in one sense, it's extremely expected and traditional. You know, you have this man who's confronted with his wife's old fling, if you want to think of it that way, and the men are trying to alpha male each other, and (laughs) it's quite normal. I mean, Mm -hmm. Heathcliff is taller. He's more manly. He's more athletic than Edgar, and now he's got manners and he's got money. It's intimidating. But then again, Edgar is richer. He has pedigree, but most importantly... Edgar has the girl. Mm. So we also find out that Heathcliff is slowly supplying Henley with money to gamble and drink with in exchange for the property over there at Wuthering Heights. I mean, that's gradual, but it becomes obvious, and later we find out it's absolutely over the course of time through lending money to Henley that Heathcliff will eventually come to own the entirety of Wuthering Heights. So Heathcliff is emerging. He's getting stronger. He's getting manlier. And Edgar just gets wimpier. One time after, and it gets so pitiful, after Heathcliff leaves Thrushcross Grange because he's visiting there all the time, Edgar actually physically cries in front of Catherine over Heathcliff's presence. And that's not endearing. And what it actually does, it empowers Catherine. And it's not surprising that Catherine has absolutely decided Edgar will allow Heathcliff into their world, and she's confident, absolutely confident, he doesn't have the strength nor the will to defy her. I love this quote. She says this, I have such faith in Linton's love that I believe I might kill him, and he wouldn't wish to retaliate. Again, another classic red flag for what we've been talking about. And, uh, of course, um, that is a confession of her total disdain uh, for Edgar, which is something we could talk about, even though I know we don't have time, because at the same time all this is going on, uh, we're sideswiped with the even greater tragedy of Isabella. Now, just for those of us who are still trying to keep track of the characters, let's review. Edgar and Isabella are brother and sister. Yes, that's right. And remember, Isabella is a year younger than Catherine. Well, and in this chapter, we find out that she is in love with Heathcliff. She actually says, I love him more than you ever loved Edgar, and he might love me if you'd let him. The poor thing has wandered into a terrible trap. (laughs) True. To which Catherine wisely replies, I wouldn't be you for a kingdom then. And let me skip down. Heathcliff is an unreclaimed creature without refinement, without cultivation, and an arid wilderness and furs and windstone. I'd as soon put that little canary into the park on a winter's day as recommend you to bestow your heart on him. It's deplorable ignorance of his character, child, and nothing else which makes that dream into your head. Pray don't imagine that he conceals depths of benevolence and affection beneath a stern exterior. He's not a rough diamond, a pearl containing oyster of a rustic he's a fierce pitiless wolfish man i never say to him let this or that enemy alone because it would be ungenerous or cruel to harm them i say let them alone because i should hate them to be wronged and he'd crush you like a sparrow's egg isabella if he found you a troublesome charge i know he couldn't love a linton and yet he'd be quite capable of marrying your fortune and expectations avarice is growing with him a besetting sin there's my picture and i'm his friend oh my goodness wow (laughs) not an endorsement you should run after a (sighs) after a recommendation like that so you can't say Catherine doesn't understand him um and in a moment of what could be interpreted as kindness but seems more like selfish jealousy she uh reveals isabella's infatuation to heathcliff and uh, she ends it with these lovely words I like her too well, my dear Heathcliff, to let you absolutely seize and devour her up. To which he says, I like her too ill to attempt it, except in a very ghoulish fashion. That's so horrible. I know, they're terrible. But then he remembers this. She's her brother's heir, is she not? And of course, we are set up for what eventually will come in chapter 12 when Heathcliff, in order to get revenge on Edgar and maybe even Catherine hangs Isabella's dog, and they run off together to get married in the middle of the night. What? I know. So Isabella is Heathcliff's first object of revenge. And what we see in short, since we have to really skip the details here, is that she's first 
a link in this complicated struggle to steal Thrushcross Grange from Edgar. And it's an opportunity that just comes to him. She makes it so easy to talk her into eloping with him. He really wants to take everything from Edgar, or as the book says, he wants to provoke Edgar to despair. But actually, if we read it, it's even worse than that. Later, we're going to see how abusive he can be to Isabella, physically, emotionally, sexually. There is a depth of evil in Heathcliff that he didn't have as a child. He's changed. Nellie, in the first part of the book, praises Heathcliff. She says he tells the truth, even if he knows he'd get in trouble. But all of that integrity, gone. From the time he comes back... This is a man that has no feelings except for revenge and whatever we're going to call this passionate desire to possess Catherine is. He confesses to Nellie that his first act of marriage, and he says it almost proudly, was to hang Isabella's little dog. (laughs) Which reminds me, what's going on with dogs in this book? I mean, there's a lot of dog references. I know, that's so true and a great point, and I want to talk about it, but we don't have time, so we'll get into it next week. Emily was a huge dog lover and she gives dogs a lot of interesting roles in the book but back to Heathcliff listen to how he talks about his wife and how he feels about her this is what he says I have no pity the worms writhe the more I yearn to crush out their entrails it is a moral teething and I grind with greater energy in proportion to the increase of pain He gets energy from hurting her. I mean, just reading those words makes me uncomfortable. Because you're looking at somebody who's antisocial disorder, but good. Isabella, poor little victim number one, kind of provides us with this transition between the first generation, and we're talking about Heathcliff and Catherine and Edgar and herself, to the second generation, where we get a glimpse of that in chapter 11 when Nellie visits Wuthering Heights. Because what we see in chapter 11 is Heathcliff turning Harrington into himself. He wants to recreate his own childhood abuse through Harrington. Remember, that's Henley's son. He raises him to be exactly like he was as a child, but that part of his childhood that he's ashamed of. He raises Harrington to be dirty, he's feral, he's violent. He outwardly acts every bit like little Heathcliff. He even throws a rock at Nellie when she decides to follow the superstitious whim and come up there to visit. Heathcliff explains this as a deliberate intent in chapter 17. He says this, Now, my bonny lad, you are mine, and we'll see if one tree won't grow as crooked as another with the same wind to twist it. Heathcliff wants Henley's son to be just as degraded as he was, which in some ways is kind of disturbing because listen to what we've said about Heathcliff and Catherine. Harrington is not only Henley's son. He's Catherine's nephew, and the book says he looks like Catherine. Heathcliff is well on his way uh, to getting everything that he wants. He has an easy plan to steal Wuthering Heights, is an easy plan to steal Harrington from Hidley and turn him into a wild, feral animal. And he has an easy plan to steal Isabella from Edgar. And even Catherine is now telling Edgar he's just going to have to deal with it. That Heathcliff is coming over to visit her and there's nothing that he can do about it until Edgar decides he's going to try to fight back. <laughs> until then. The incident in the kitchen where Catherine locks the two of them inside is believable but also really funny when Edgar literally tries to fight Heathcliff and punches him in the neck. (laughs) And then runs from the kitchen into the garden to get back up. Well, he should. (laughs) And all of this, Catherine blames Edgar for this altercation because he was eavesdropping. And for Isabella because she's romantically interested in Heathcliff. So Heathcliff is banished and she says this. If I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friends, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That (laughs) makes perfect sense to nobody (laughs) except a disordered person. So it's psychologically interesting uh, that the one time Edgar tries to stand up to Catherine, it ultimately results in her death. 
Uh, Catherine's death sequence is somewhat uh, famous. Her her standing in that window is uh, on a lot of artwork related to this book, uh, but it's a strange sequence. And again, uh, as a reader, I find myself really confused by what I think I'm seeing. There's so much that is manic, uh, so extreme. Catherine works herself up into a frenzy. She refuses to eat, although on the third day she does drink water and eat a little dry toast that Nellie gives her. At one point, um, she dashes her head against the arm of a sofa and grinds her teeth so hard Nellie describes it uh, as if they were going to crash into splinters. And Edgar doesn't go after her. He just leaves her and he retreats into the library. He doesn't even see mm-hmm. all of this display. And again, this is another one of those instances where Nellie interjects herself into the lives of these people and really permanently alters the course of events. Nellie downplays Catherine antics. And when Linton sees her once going crazy, she's got blood on her lips. Nellie downplays it. It's nothing. She never tells anyone that Catherine is starving herself, making herself crazy. She never tells Edgar. And this does alter the course of events. Although I will do say, I don't think it's actually physically possible for this to happen. But maybe it does. Because Catherine does go crazy in that very gothic way Mm. we we saw this death by emotion in frankenstein it's in (laughs) dracula and dr jekyll and mr hyde all the great books have people dying like this and i should i guess next week kind of talk about what a gothic book is i love that phrase death by emotion (laughs) you know very gothic um, you know, but as I see it, uh, Bronte's really sizing up a passionate relationship um, that's challenging the connection between passion and love altogether. It, it seems Catherine Heathcliff's love is amoral and antisocial. And it, it climaxes here with Catherine willing her own death with some sort of hope that in death she can regain something from her childhood. I mean, it's getting Freudian now. <laughs> It is weird. So Catherine starves herself for three days and then craziness happens. And and I have to say, this is one of my favorite lines. She says, oh, I've been tormented. I've been haunted, Nellie. And I begin to fancy you don't like me. How strange. I thought though everyone hated and despised each other, they could not avoid loving me. It's not too long after that that she tears the pillow with her teeth and she demands that Nellie open the window in the middle of the night. And of course, we have symbolism here because she wants to view herself in an old way, her old Earnshaw self, maybe regressing into childhood. She also wants to, well, I don't know if she wants to, but she catches a glimpse of herself in a mirror. Again, another symbol. And she's aghast. And she says all kinds of crazy things. She looks for Withering Heights. She looks for somebody in there. Finally, Nellie tries to pacify her and say, there's nobody here. It was yourself, Mrs. Linton. Catherine is unable to recognize herself. Then she goes on and she opens the window herself. And she says a lot. But she ends with this. She says this. Oh, I'm burning. I wish I were out of doors. I wish I were a girl again, half savage and hearty and free and laughing at injuries, not maddening under them. Why am I so changed? Why does my blood rush into a hell of tumult at a few words? I'm sure I should be myself once again among the heather on those hills. Open the window again, wide, fasten it open, quick. Why don't you move? Of course, after she gives this little speech, she crosses the room, throws open the window, bends outside into the frosty, bitter air. It's pitch black, no moon. She looks into the darkness and rants again about her childhood, about Joseph, and goes on and on until Edgar walks in. Edgar, of course, is going to be shocked. He's going to try to nurse her to health, but spoiler, it doesn't get better. <laughs> Well, and if you thought that sequence of events was confusing, uh, Bronte takes it up a notch. And it gets really confusing. All the craziness with Catherine, and at the same time, we we have this parallel story with Isabella running off, getting married, and Heathcliff moves her to Wuthering Heights. And we then circle back to Catherine and her illness. And Heathcliff literally tells Isabella that Catherine's illness is Edgar's fault. 
and promises that Isabella is going to suffer by being Edgar's proxy until he can get a hold of Edgar. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, and, and two months pass just like that, and before we know it, Isabella is pregnant and has discovered that uh, Heathcliff is evil, and in her words, Mr. Heathcliff, is Mr. Heathcliff a man? If so, is he mad? And if not, is he a devil? She should have listened. Catherine told her. Mm. (laughs) Of course, that brings us to the framing of the story again, because right here in the middle of chapter 13, Bronte introduces a third narrator. And in this one instance, Isabella gets to tell her own story via a letter that she writes to Nellie. Bronte is really wanting us as readers to feel this chaotic, gothic whirlwind so she introduces a third frame narrative in order to do this what we see here is the state of life at withering heights it's dark it's violent it's dirty it's isolating and isabella is immersed in this and the letter isabella describes the misery that's her life and she begs nelly to intercede between her and edgar because edgar has abandoned his sister schmuck But anyway, Isabella is the one character that's weaker than Edgar, and he just abandons her. It's his gentility, his propriety, his ego. I don't know what it is, but Isabella needs grace. She needs a loving hero to rescue her, and Edgar will not be that man. It does appear that Isabella will leave the story um, as arguably the most unloved character in the book, sadly. Uh, Both Edgar's and Heathcliff's final moments with Catherine are dramatic in each one their own way, but Isabella's exit's pathetic. I mean, what a contrast to how this plays out. Of course, we see Nellie interferes again, first by going over to Wuthering Heights and telling Isabella she's been cut off. But then listening to Heathcliff rant as to how for every thought Catherine spends on Linton, she spends a thousand on him. That losing her would be hell. That if Linton loved Catherine with all the powers of his puny being, he couldn't love as much in 80 years as Heathcliff could in a day. And that, of course, Catherine's heart is as deep as his. He goes on to tell her that he goes to the Grange every night for six hours and will until he can get in. And then one day when Edgar is away, Nellie sneaks Heathcliff up to see Catherine. Their exchange is passionate for sure. He grabs and holds her on for five minutes and there's kisses and there's really this first sense of sexuality between the two that there's never been before. And at one point he even bruises her physically there's a lot of blame and i think we need to read a little bit of this out of their own mouth you want to give it a go i'll read Catherine's parts if you'll read heathcliff oh kathy oh my life how can i bear it was the first sentence he uttered in a tone that did not seek to disguise his despair and now he stared at her so earnestly that i thought the very intensity of his gaze would bring tears into his eyes but they burned with anguish. They did not melt. What now, said Catherine, leaning back and returning his look with a suddenly clouded brow. Her humor was a mere vein for constant varying caprices. You and Edgar have broken my heart, Heathcliff, and you both come to bewail the deed to me, as if you were the people to be pitied. I shall not pity you, not I. You have killed me, and thriving on it, I think. How strong you are. How many years do you mean to live after I am gone? Heathcliff had knelt on one knee to embrace her. He attempted to rise, but she seized his hair and kept him down. I wish I could hold you, she continued bitterly, till we were both dead. I shouldn't care what you suffered. I care nothing for your sufferings. Why shouldn't you suffer? I do. Will you forget me? Will you be happy when I'm in the earth? Will you say twenty years hence? That's the grave of Catherine Earnshaw. I loved her long ago and was wretched to lose her, but it's past. I've loved many others since. My children are dearer to me than she was, and at death I shall not rejoice that I am going to her. I shall be sorry that I must leave them. Will you say so, Heathcliff? Don't torture me till I am as mad as yourself, cried he, wrenching his head free and grinding his teeth. (laughs) This is so much of what we call the push-pull, the the, I hate you, don't leave me. It goes on. 
Are you possessed with a devil, he pursued savagely, to talk in that manner to me when you are dying? Do you reflect that all those words will be branded in my memory and eating deeper eternally after you have left me? You know you lie to say that I have killed you. And Catherine, you know that I could not as soon forget you as my existence. It is not sufficient for your infernal selfishness that while you are at peace I shall writhe in the torments of hell. I shall not be at peace moaned Cathy, recalled to a sense of physical weakness by the violent, unequal throbbing of her heart, which beat visibly and audibly under this excessive agitation. She said nothing further till the paroxysm was over, then she continued more kindly. I'm not wishing you greater torment than I have, Heathcliff. I only wish us never to be parted, and should a word of mine distress you hereafter, think I feel the same distress underground, and for my own sake, Forgive me. Come here and kneel down again. You never harmed me in your life. Nay, if you nurse anger, then will be worse to remember than my harsh words. Won't you come here again? Do. And of course, this goes on uh, until he flings himself into a seat. He's described as foaming like a mad dog. And Nellie says a movement of Catherine's relieved her a little bit because she put up her hand to clasp his neck and bring her cheek to his, and he holds her, and then they return, covering her with a frantic caress. And she says this, or he says this. You teach me now how cruel you've been, cruel and false. Why did you despise me? Why did you betray your own heart, Kathy? I have not one word of comfort. You deserve this. You have killed yourself. Yes, you may kiss me and cry. And wring out my kisses and tears. They'll blight you. They'll damn you. You loved me. Then what right had you to leave me? What right answer me for the poor fancy you felt for Linton? Because misery and degradation and death and nothing that God or Satan could inflict would have parted us. You, of your own will, did it. I have not broken your heart. You have broken it. And in breaking it, you have broken mine. So much the worse for me that I am strong. Do I want to live? What kind of living will it be when you, oh God, would you like to live with your soul in the grave? Let me alone. Let me alone. If I've done wrong, I'm dying for it. It is enough. You left me too, but I won't upbraid you. I forgive you. Forgive me. It's hard to forgive and to look at those eyes and feel those wasted hands. Kiss me again and don't let me see your eyes. I forgive what you have done to me. I love my murderer, but yours... How can I? I mean, they do seem to love and resent each other with the same level uh-huh. of intensity. There's so much blame here. Well, and it's just nonsensical, and it's just raging, and they're emotionally unstable, and uh, they struggle with loneliness and abuse and all the things that make people vulnerable to addictions. And this addictive love wants to break down the boundaries of identity and and merge these two lovers into one identity. And, you know, an addict wants possession uh, regardless of the consequences to themselves or others. And we've seen here that uh, we're nowhere near the realm of a healthy, loving relationship capable of putting the needs of another person first. And, of course, Bronte takes the scene all the way to death. Yes, because... At midnight, little baby Catherine is born, and Mother Catherine dies two hours later. Nellie finds the death sequence actually peaceful, and she goes out to tell Heathcliff what has happened, and he has a very interesting response. May she wake in torment, he cried with frightful vehemence, stamping his foot and groaning in a sudden paroxysm of ungovernable passion. Why, she's a liar to the end. Where is she? Not there? Not in heaven? Not perished? Where? Oh, you said you cared nothing for my sufferings, and I pray one prayer. I repeat it till my tongue stiffens. Catherine Earnshaw, may you not rest as long as I am living. (laughs) You said I killed you. Haunt me then. The murdered do haunt their murderers. I believe I know that ghosts have wandered on earth. Be with me always. Take any form. Drive me mad. Only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. O God, it is unutterable. I cannot live without my life. I cannot live without my soul. 
These are wretched people. <laughs> well, there are two more strange things that you should take note of about the death of Catherine. Before she's buried, Heathcliff sneaks into her room and he takes this locket that she has around her neck. He opens and he put his hair inside it. And Nellie, who interferes yet again, goes back and she gets some of Catherine's hair and she takes Catherine's hair and his hair. She twists them together and puts them back in the locket. The second thing to notice is that Catherine is not buried in the cemetery. And there's several ways to look at this. She's buried on a green slope outside in nature. And of course, this could be Bronte nodding to her untamed wildness. But it also might be that Bronte is holding Catherine responsible for killing herself because in that culture and that day, if you committed suicide, you weren't allowed to be laid in the local cemetery. I don't know. It's not explained. Hmm. Just an <laughs> interesting point to note. Yeah. Uh, and, and after Catherine's death, the, the level of obsession Heathcliff has with Catherine does not lessen. Uh, in some ways, it just channels more sharply into rage and revenge. And he can rage at Isabella. He can rage at Harriton. He can rage at any and all of them. And in fact, it's energizing. Uh, it will be revenge that keeps Heathcliff alive for the rest of the book. Yes, he has this compulsion to recreate past circumstances, which we'll see through the manipulation of the children next week. But one thing that shows up here, and it's quite pitiful, is this inverted relationship he has with Henley Earnshaw, who by now is a total drunkard with no money and basically is 100% dependent on Heathcliff. But Heathcliff continually decides that he wants to murder he Heathcliff. Well, I'm sorry, Henley. There's a lot of H's. I know. Henley decides he's going to murder Heathcliff. Even tells Isabella this the first night that she moves in. And apparently he walks around armed with a knife and a pistol. And he's going to do it. But it's all very chaotic. And Henley tells Isabella of his plans. One time it's serious. Isabella tells Heathcliff. She tries to lock the door to prevent the murder. Henry somehow does get shot. But in the end, he gets cut up and the gun gets taken away. It all ends with Heathcliff kicking the living daylights out of him, although he does fall short of killing them. And what's really interesting in this exchange, beyond all of that violence, which is just sheer madness, is that in a way, Heathcliff has completed the revenge. Listen to what Henley says. He says this, and remember in the beginning, he says, I wish to have revenge on Henley. I would enjoy it. He says this, Oh, if God would give me strength to strangle him in my last agony, I'd go to hell with joy. That's what Henley says. And he rides up to, and he sinks back in despair. To which Isabella says, Nay, it's enough that he has murdered one of you. At the Grange, everyone knows your sister would have been living now had it not been for Mr. Heathcliff. After all, it is preferable to be hated than loved by him. When I recollect how happy we were... How happy Catherine was before he came. I'm fit to curse the day. And of course, these are some of the last words that Isabella will have with Heathcliff because she's leaving. She runs and stumbles all the way back to Thrushrush Grange. And of course, her hard brother Edgar won't help her and she knows it. So she ends up running all the way to London. And it's there that she has a son that she names Linton Heathcliff. And that's where she'll stay till the end of her life. Okay. Hmm. Well, Heathcliff does leave her alone, uh, but he also does tell Nellie, and I'll quote Heathcliff here, I'll have it when I want it. They may reckon on that. And of course, he's referring to Isabella's child. Well, by chapter 17, Catherine's dead. Henley dies six months after Catherine. Then Nellie jumps in the story to, for 12 years and Isabella dies in London. Her son is 12. Kathy, Catherine's daughter, is 13. And we are ready now to have the exact same life played out all over again. But this time, Heathcliff will fill the role of old Mr. Earnshaw because he's inherited the entire Earnshaw estate. He's in charge. And here is the second generation. Heathcliff is raising an unloved child as a servant in a house he should have inherited. Edgar is raising a beloved child, little Kathy. He never refers to her as Catherine. 
who he never lets out into the world very much like his parents did to him. But in this book of parallels, Nellie points out the parallel that, in a nice way, Edgar uses Kathy as a place to find redemption, where Henley does not seek redemption in his son. Instead, he despairingly just surrenders Harriton. And then there's Linton, not Edgar Linton, but Isabella's son, Linton Heathcliff, the most pitiful of all. Well, he got the worst of all the <laughs> DNA. I mean, a, a pale, sickly boy sent to live with his father, and Heathcliff's revenge seems very much a done deal, or is it? What is the power of revenge? Who does revenge really destroy? Great questions. Yeah, and, and can generational abuse ever be stopped, or is it just destined to go on and on? Bronte asks a lot of questions, but unlike some writers, we'll watch her answer them next week. Good, and if you have survived so far <laughs> up to this point, we're going to... It's called Wuthering Heights. <laughs> we may feel wuthered by now. Anyway, thanks for being with us. Uh, we appreciate your support. We appreciate you sharing the podcast. Um, check us out on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and also our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. And thank you for all that you do to keep us going. Peace out.